craving as a location. In fact, it defines locations. It becomes the seed around which the process of becoming gathers. Like little bits of dust in the atmosphere that become seeds for clouds, seeds for rain. And it's good to know where the location is. Because all too often we think we want something, and actually, it's, once we get it, we realize this is not what you really wanted. You have to go look and go back and look at well, where was that original desire located? And this is how we come into life. As we're about to die from our previous lifetimes, a vision of the human realm came in. There was something in the human realm that you found attractive. And you didn't look at the fine print. You just went for that image, whatever it was. And it's this ability of the mind to slip off that way and to slip into worlds without really knowing where it's going, simply because it's attracted by some little bit of pleasure, some image, some idea. Primarily sensual pleasures. And this is why there's so much in the canon about the drawbacks of sensuality. After all, one of the ways of suffering is through sensual clinging. One of the causes for suffering is sensual craving. And sensuality here doesn't mean the pleasures in and of themselves. It's the mind's fascination with them, all the embroidery that we create around them, all the perceptions and feelings and thought constructs, verbal and mental fabrications. Often that's where our craving is focused. So you want to get the mind really still so you can see when craving of any kind comes up, exactly what are you focused on? What is the allure? Because that's going to be where the location is found. And once you've seen the allure, then you look around. What else is tied up with that? Those are the things we don't look at. Something looks appealing. We don't think about what the other implications are. We think, well, this appealing thing will have this wonderful world around it. But to look at it, beauty, youth, power, wealth, what kind of world is run by those things? Twiggy, who was a famous model back in the 60s, was involved in Hollywood for a while, and then she left it. And several years later, I read an interview in which she was talking about how Hollywood was all about beauty, youth, power, wealth. He said all those other horrible things like that. It was a good perspective. Because in a world where those things reign, it's a pretty miserable world. People who don't have beauty, who don't have power and wealth, are thrown away, have no worth at all. And our happiness depends on those things. We have to very quickly learn to find a happiness that depends on something else, otherwise we're headed for a big fall. Because all too often, when you don't have those things, you miss them. And if you have a chance to get them again, this is what happens at rebirth. You gotta, here's another chance. You want to go for another round? You have to think about the implications. As the Buddha said, we, we tend to go for what he calls householder pleasure and householder pain. In other words, sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations that we'd like. If we get them, that's householder pleasure. If we don't get them, that's householder pain. So you've got to replace those with renunciant pleasure, renunciant pain. Renunciant pain is the realization, okay, there is a much higher form of happiness. I haven't found it yet. It's a painful thought, but it's a thought that motivates you to practice. And then the renunciant pleasure is when you're able to let go of sensuality and find pleasure, at the very least, in getting the mind in concentration. The realization that there is such a pleasure is a really important discovery. We should try to make the most of it. It's not the goal, but it certainly helps pull us out of a lot of misery. So you're not starving for pleasure. 
Otherwise, you're just going back and forth between householder pleasure and householder pain. So part of, part of the way out is seeing the, the value, the real sense of satisfaction that can come from finding a pleasure that comes simply from getting the mind to settle in. But also, you have to see the drawbacks of the sensuality, not just the drawbacks. The Buddha uses the word degradation. You think about people's relationships, there's a lot of degradation that goes on in sensual relationships. Both people become enslaved to each other. In the Terragata and Terragata, there are some of the more dramatic encounters where people come and try to tempt monks and nuns. In the Terragata, there's the, the famous story about the nun who's going through the forest, and this man comes up and tries to get her to disrobe. And it's interesting, he, there's nothing mentioned about how good-looking he was. All we see are his words, and he's a real master of spinning words. He hopes to spin a net in which to catch her, based on his appreciation of her beauty and all the beautiful things he's going to provide her with. Fortunately, she's not attracted to her own body. She said, what do you see in this body that's of any worth? The fact that she's not attracted to herself and doesn't mind not being attractive to herself. That's what frees her. In other, in other words, she's found something much better. Because for a lot of people, that's what the attraction is, is someone else is attracted to them. After all, as the Buddha said, our desire for sensuality, our desire for other people, starts out with our sense of our own attractiveness. And then we look for other people that we find attractive who are also attractive to us. And that's where the magnet pulls. So you've got to cut those force fields. First by looking at the unattractiveness of your body, and not just your body when it's obviously not appealing, but also when it's at its most appealing. Even then, if you turn it inside out, what would you have? Nothing much that you'd want to go for. You realize, oh, this is the way it is with all bodies. And this is what you get when you have that vision of, say, a sensual pleasure when you could be reborn as a beautiful person, an attractive person. But you get all the things that go along with having a body, all the various parts of the body, and every part of the body has an illness or more than one illness associated with it. And it's going to grow old. It's going to grow unattractive. And you want to keep going back with that? In the Taragata, there's a, a verse where this monk is approached by this woman. And here we get to see how beautiful she is. And she says, you're wasting your youth. Let's enjoy each other, and then when we're both old, then we can go forth in. After there's nothing left of, of attractiveness in the body. And he says he looked at her and he saw a snare of death laid out. That's what you got to see. The people you're attracted to, they're snares of death. The pleasures you're attracted to that would pull you to be reborn in a sensual world, a sensory world, those are snares of death, because when you're reborn, there's going to be death. There's no escaping it. It's like that animated film, Ice Age, I think it was Ice Age 2. I don't know how many Ice Ages they've had, but I think it was two. I was on a plane one time, and the kid sitting in the row in front of me was watching the series. And there was one incident where there, a group of them, male and female animals, are in a boat and it's in a fog. And as they're going through the fog, all of a sudden these mermaids appear. And a merman appears for the woman, the old turtle, the old lady turtle. And they're all very attractive to them. And all of a sudden they begin to see, though, however, that they're static in the image. And as you look into the static, you see the fangs of teeth. So it's good to have that image in, in mind when you see something attractive, especially as the mind is approaching death. Then there's an inclination to want to go for whatever pleasure there may be, because you're surrounded by pain at that point. The physical pain, the pains in the body, the mental pains of having to leave this life, being uncertain, and then suddenly latching on something that looks good. You've got to be watching out for it. Just because things look good doesn't mean they are. 
Look for the static. Look for the fangs. And don't wait until you're on your deathbed before you start thinking in these terms. This is why contemplation of the body is such a basic part of the meditation. It's why we have that chant that we repeat so many times. This is what you have in your body. This is what other people have in their bodies. This is all the fine print that comes along with the idea of sensual pleasure. And you can think in these terms and you think, well, maybe that pleasure, that's the renunciate pleasure, actually is a better thing. So on the one hand, we provide the mind with an alternative pleasure, and this is one of the reasons why we practice concentration, and one of the reasons why we try to learn how to sit through pain and maintain our concentration, because we're going to need it when the body's in pain, the mind is in pain, so that we're not pained along with it, and so we're not driven by desperation to just jump for whatever there is. But at the same time, you have to have that wisdom that looks for the long term, looks for the whole picture instead of just looking just at a particular pleasure. Pleasant sight, sound, smell, taste, tactile sensation that can be very alluring. Look for the world around it. What's tied up with that pleasure? And look for the static inside the image. Look for the fangs. They're there if you're willing to look for them. These things are all around us. People who die are, are dying. Why? Because they got born. People are getting old. All the things that we see in the human realm, that they came because people wanted to be reborn as people. On the one hand, we call it the fine print, but it's really writ large when you actually get into the reality. So be care, very careful about where you locate your cravings. Look for the allure, and then look for the drawback and the degradation, all the other bad things about whatever the pleasure might be. And that, the Buddha says, when you're ready to think about, well, maybe the idea of renunciation really is good. When he gave his graduated discourse, he started out with generosity, virtue, the rewards of generosity and virtue, which would be experience as pleasure here in the human realm and then up in the higher realms. And then, before he taught the Four Noble Truths, he had to take you through that step of seeing the drawbacks and degradation of sensuality, to the point where you say, well, renunciation really is good. The pleasure of a concentrated mind is not just a second best, it's actually much better. And then you're ready for the Four Noble Truths. So make sure you have this step well down. That's an important step in the way out.